and go, 4 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and our flagship energy show. We have like five of them, yeah. And um, uh, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, supported by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. A word on what we're doing here today. We have the honor of Jeff Ono. Jeff Ono was a consumer advocate for nearly 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> consumer advocate of the state of Hawaii. I mean, he, he really was there a long time. If you if you put this in perspective, um, 2008 was the you know the, the demarcation of the Clean Energy Initiative. That's when Linda Lingle made the Energy Agreement, which is very interesting. Sometime we'll have to study that. Um, and shortly thereafter, you became the consumer advocate. When did you become consumer advocate? I started in January 2008. 11. Oh, 11, okay. And and for those critical years, you know, he was in the middle of the mix, I would say, and uh, he appeared in a lot of our Energy Policy Forum programs, and he was a friend of the Energy Policy Forum, and an important consumer advocate. And we have the honor of having him here today. This is special, because he's the former consumer advocate now. It's different. <laughs> but he still comes around. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Now I'm going to have a formal introduction by Ray Starling. The co Welcome to you, too, Ray. Well, thank you, Jay. I'm glad to be here. And um, you know, in keeping with this month's uh, theme, that we're going to look at whatever happened to this or that clean energy initiative. We thought that since uh, Jeff was available now to come and, and talk uh, without the pressures of uh, worrying about that he was he looks consumer so relaxed. advocate, he's now the former <laughs> consumer advocate, and uh, we wanted him to talk about whatever happened to all of those clean energy initiatives that looked so great when they got started, and then some some actually made it down the road a bit, and then others just fell off the uh, the edge, and we've never heard about them again. And so Jeff has some thoughts on that. He was right in the middle of the every dog fight that happened along the way, and uh, so we're, we're very happy to have him on board today. Yeah, it's all about continuity. So, you know, in 14 minutes, <laughs> can you tell us what happened? Where do I begin? <laughs> well, let, let, let me start by saying that uh, you know, the, the role of the consumer advocate has always been to protect consumer interests in all matters that come before the Public Utilities Commission. And um, the, the goal, the statutory goal is to make sure that the utilities provide safe and reliable service at just and reasonable rates. Uh, because of the statutory you know, uh, renewable portfolio standard, the energy efficiency portfolio standard, um, our state policy to renewable energy, th those goals and th that mission has changed. So it included incorporating renewable energy, but not at any cost to make sure that the, the costs were, uh, you know, we had cost effective projects that didn't cause too much harm to ratepayers. Um, and this is important for two reasons. One is you don't want to hurt ratepayers. Yes. But the other is if you have economic changes that are sudden and disruptive, you have a bad effect on the economy. The economy does not absorb these changes easily, so you have to moderate things. Certainly true. So you know, the first question is, you know, what happened to some of these renewable energy projects? So what I wanted to talk about was because one of the first things that, that struck me when I, when I took my position as consumer advocate was the competitive bidding framework. I, I, you know, it seemed uh, it was a, a cumbersome process. Uh, it took too long. There were already complaints back in 2011 about it. Um, it, it trying to evaluate bids uh, was very difficult. When you're looking at a, a project, a solar farm, a 25 megawatt solar farm on Oahu and trying to compare it to a 200 megawatt wind project on Lanai to cable to Oahu, I mean, how do you decide you know, which project should be accepted and, and which one shouldn't? And, but that was, was the nature of the, the competitive bidding framework. Um, and, and that was a problem. And you know, so in, back in 2013, Hawaiian Electric, I thought, had a pretty good idea you know, let's, let's try to seek waivers from the competitive bidding framework to try to get projects in the, in the ground a lot quicker. So they went out for a solicitation to get developers to uh, propose projects, and they had to meet certain criteria. And I thought the criteria was, well, they were pretty good. 
Um, at that time, we were seeing power purchase agreement being priced at 22 cents or greater per kilowatt hour. So Hawaiian Electric came in and said, if you're gonna propose a project and get a waiver from the competitive bidding framework, you have to be priced no less than 17 cents a kilowatt hour. You have to have site control or evidence of some site control. You have to have an outline of a community benefits outreach program. So there were a lot of good things in this solicitation. And we were hoping that we were gonna see a real price breakthrough because of it. Uh, instead, what we saw was a long, drawn-out process. So from 2013 to, to the present, we, we have one project, the, the Eurus project, the Wainai Solar project, 28 megawatt solar. Um, I think it just started commercial operations. And, and we have a number of unhappy developers. Who never got to first base with it. Well, who, so who got to first base and spent millions of dollars, but who, whose projects were not accepted. Mm. And, and that was a problem. Uh, you know, it, it started out well-intentioned, but because of various things that went on, uh, and I think some of it is miscommunication with the developers. I think some developers seem to have gone into this solicitation process with the idea that if they had proposed a project, their PPA was accepted by Hawaiian Electric, that the consumer advocate and the PUC would then approve those projects. So it came as a surprise to them when the consumer advocate, when, when you know, we came out and said, of the eight projects that ended up being proposed, we said, no, PUC, we think only these four should be selected. Um, as it turned out, we didn't pick the Eurus project. We picked the four <laughs> projects. <That's> cute. <laughs> we, we picked the four projects that we that I thought would would give short, at least in the on the short term, true benefits to to consumers. All of the projects showed long term benefits, but when you start projecting. 10, 15, 20 years into the future, it's very difficult to predict what's gonna happen. It's very difficult to determine, are these projects really gonna be, in the long term, beneficial mm -hmm. to consumers? So we looked at the short term, and we said these four, we, these four projects, and we picked the three Sun Edison projects, and, and we picked a different one than yours. As it turned out, the three Sun Edison projects went away because Sun Edison went into bankruptcy. That's why we end up with only one. What about the other one? Well, the other one was, was the, the, the and ended up with, as the Eurus okay. project. So uh, 28 mega, megawatts, uh, you know, does uh, remind me of the KIUC project. It's happening right now. But you mentioned before before the show began that in, in the case of KIUC, they, they didn't have a problem with competitive billing. Well, what, what was the difference between um, you know, the Hawaiian Electric area and the KIUC area? Well, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative is a, is a cooperative utility. It's not investor-owned. They don't answer to shareholders. They answer to its members who are, who are their, its own customers. So the, the PUC has determined KIUC doesn't need to go through a competitive bidding framework. So when AES, who ended up with this project that you're, you're referring to, came to KIUC, uh, KIUC didn't have to say, well, wait a minute, we've got to go bid this out, we have to do an RFP, a request for proposal, get it approved by the commission, have all these interested developers come in, bid on the project. Instead, they can start negotiating right away with AES, which is what happened. Isn't that unfair? Well, KIUC could effectively do its own waivers on all these projects, and he go had to go to the commission and go through all that process and delay. Well, I don't think it's necessarily unfair because of the difference in the the ownership structure of the of the two companies, but we need to improve the competitive bidding framework for Hawaiian Electric. We need to get the process. Uh, Smooth, smooth out so that things can happen quicker, mm. so that we're not placing greater risk on developers. As, as what, what, you know, that's what ended up happening in the in the waiver projects. Mm -hmm. The developers were complaining that they took on a lot of risk. They spent millions of dollars only to see their projects getting rejected. Yeah. So looking at the thing comprehensively. A, we don't, we're not doing LNG anymore. That's pretty much off the table. Um, B, um, solar is uh, under a handicap now because, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's declined. 
It's declined. Rooftop solar. Rooftop solar, sorry. Right. Rooftop solar declined, and nobody knows where it ends, but a lot of companies have gone out of business or changed their business, and so it's not a happy time for the solar installers. Um, and let's see, wind has been subject to it's one of those one of those cases, Ray, where whatever happened to wind, you know, right. w wind is not doing very well. The big, you know, projects for wind are all off the table. They're really done. They're not coming back. Where are we? You know, really, Jeff? I mean, it, it seems to me that with all of the exuberance of October 2008, we're stuck in something. What do you think? Well, we, we do have one, one more wind project that is supposed to go in, you know, possibly soon, uh, the Nap Napua Makani wind, wind farm out in Kahuku. Mm. But that's being, um, you know, there's significant community opposition to that project. Having gone out to the Kahuku community, been to neighborhood board meetings um, out there, you know, I, I really doubt that we're going to see another wind project on Oahu. Napua Makani might be the last one, assuming it gets built. But uh, the communities don't seem to want wind farms. Uh, they're aesthetically, um, you know, not appreciated by a number of people. Yeah. So the communities don't want wind. Um, Geothermal is under a kind of glass ceiling there in Puna. Uh, more, I mean, it's a very strong glass ceiling. It's, it's tempered glass, that ceiling. Uh, and it's political and cultural, what have you. Um, we have solar that, uh, that is solar on rooftops, I mean, single family rooftops and all that has declined. Community solar has not really done very much. Utility scale solar has not done very much. The waiver projects have not been all that successful. Um, we're still, you know, what is it, 80 plus percent um, on fossil fuel and, and must be near 100 percent on. Uh, on uh, transportation fuel, and it's been eight years since we committed to this grand, grand uh, dream. And then we said, oh, last year, we're going to do it by 2045. I'm not sure if that's throwing it on the wall or what. Um, but here we are. It seems to me that we're kind of stuck now. Agree or disagree? Uh, well, I disagree, Jay. I, I don't think we're stuck. I, I, you know, I think we're at a point where I think people need to understand that in order to incorporate greater and greater amounts of rooftop solar, and, and you know, HECO can do it, but they need to, they, they need to upgrade their system. And that, that, to modernize the grid as we've been talking about, it's going to be costly. It, it might be billions of dollars to do it. Who's going to pay that? Well, ratepayers are going to—they're going to fund the bulk of it. But we're sensitive. We're real sensitive on rates. So people are going to—they're going to squawk about wind, but they're also going to squawk about rates. Uh, is the public on board here? Because if the public is not on board, this is a, a troubled, a, a troubled uh, course of action. Yeah, the, the the trajectory for for rates into the future is going to be a, an upward tra trajectory. You'd like to—we are hoping that there's going to be offsets because of. Of cost cost savings, um, you know, we will use less oil. We'll save on oil. Um, you know, we'll incorporate greater amounts of renewable energy. That and renewable energy prices have come down. The cost to install solar, the cost to install wind farms have co come down significantly. And we're hoping to be able to capture some of those savings and put those savings into into bills so that the the cost to modernize the grid will will partially be absorbed by, by cost savings. But the, re the reality of it is that bills will, will, are likely to go up as we modernize the grid. Yeah, no surprise, right? We were saying that a long time ago. If you want to put new infrastructure in, you want to put new technology in, it costs money and somebody has to pay. And that means the rate payer. Right? That's right. We're going to take a short break. Jeff Ono, former consumer advocate, uh, opining on exactly where we are in this difficult navigation of ours toward clean energy. And we're going to come back in one minute, and Ray is going to ask him a cliffhanger question. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> Hello, huh? How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man and I want you to be here every Friday 
noon. ThinkTechHawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, and I host Condo Insider. We talk about issues facing the Condo Association throughout Hawaii and talk about solutions. When you think about it, about one-third of our population lives in some form of common interest real estate. We broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Please tune in. Tune in and thank you. Aloha. We're back. We're live. And we are so happy to be talking to our old friend, Jeff Ono, former consumer advocate state of Hawaii. And we're talking about, you know, his, uh, his Jeff Ono speaks out. <laughs> And what does the former, you know, consumer advocate of the state of Hawaii have to say about our situation? And uh, and we've covered a little bit of that, the situation, where it stands today. And now we're gonna now we're gonna go down the constructive part of this discussion. So Ray, what is your question? <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, we've got this one good example, but you were ta talking before. Uh, the show, there were many examples of things that, uh, that, and we've explored some of them this month on other shows that uh, didn't pan out, uh, that didn't happen the way we thought it would. It had such promise in the beginning. So I guess if, from your experience as the consumer advocate, right in the middle of all of this, what do you see that we could do differently that would help some of the things that we thought would make it through, make it through. Now we've talked about the, the specific example uh, that you gave us today, but do you have other things? Are we structured right? Are the right entities involved in making the decisions? We, and I ask this uh, because we've, we've sort of uh, taken an inherited uh, group of uh, uh, regulations and so forth to make to, that have worked well for a hundred years, we've tried to bring those together and move it into this clean energy world. And I think that's different from what we've been doing. So do you have some ideas that you can toss out on the table and we can talk about? So you, you've asked so many questions in there, Ray. I'm just okay. gonna, I'm just gonna say what I want. Right. <laughs> you always do that. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, the, the first thing, you know, we need better planning from, from uh, Hawaiian Electric. And, you know, the, the, we had the integrated resource planning docket uh, that's where we're supposed to lay out the plan for the, the, the appropriate generation mix for Hawaiian Electric now and, and going into the future, short term, long term. And th that was rejected by, by the commission and, and it was unanimous. All the parties that participated in the IRP you know, suggested to the commission to reject that IRP plan. Um, then there was the power supply improvement plan. That was, that was rejected. So now we're on the, the, the second, or if you want to call it the third iteration we're, of, of the power supply improvement. Four years down the road with this. That's right. And we need to have an approved plan. The, I think the solicitation for the waiver projects would have gone a lot better and a lot smoother had we had a, a, an IRP or some kind of plan that was in place so that we could put those projects into context so that all of us knew how much curtailment would there be on these projects? Um, you know, w would, would HECO be able to accept 100% of the, the energy they produce or was it gonna be 90%? That was something that was, you know, we just couldn't get a good handle on because we didn't have a, an approved IRP. Um, so we, you know, and, and this is my message to my friends at the, at the PUC, we, you know, we really would like to see at least a, a short-term plan that gets approved coming out of this, this last PSIP. We, we just can't keep going on rejecting plan, rejecting plan, and not having the context by which to consider each power purchase agreement that comes before the commission. Yeah. So that's number one. You know, what I, what I hear you, well, it's number two. Number two is, you know, I, you know, we need better coordination and leadership, and and that's all, that's been a problem, you know, in Hawaii, and uh, you know, I, I, and I'll start with me, you know, I mean, I could have done a much better job going out, talking to developers, making sure developers understood that just because Hawaiian Electric agreed to a power purchase agreement with with those developers. 
that the consumer adv advocate was still going to scrutinize that PPA, that there was no guarantee that their project was going to be approved by the PUC, if, and maybe it would have gone a lot better had, had they understood that. But, you know, when after we had done our, our statement of position on, on some of those projects and said, well, you know, we don't like this one and we don't like that one, then the developers came in and started saying, well, you know, what's wrong with my project? What is it that you don't like? And, and it was too late. Yeah. Uh, let me just ask one question to, that comes out of all this, out of both of those points. It seems to me that, you know, we, the state, everyone, sees developers as, and this goes for real estate developers too, by the way, <laughs> developers, guys who put their own money in, who take risks, who sometimes, you know, cannot succeed, um, guys who sometimes get wealthy, but sometimes they get poor too. Um, that's the nature of being a developer. I, I don't think we see the need to make a path for them. We don't make it easy for them. And in not making it easy, we, we cut down the class of people, the group of people, the subset of people who are willing to take the risk. So we get fewer people making proposals, fewer people actually doing development. And in so doing, we hurt ourselves. So what I hear out of both points one and two is that we've got to tell them we love them. <laughs> we want developers. We want development. It's not a bad thing. And we will be mindful of the risks they take and not enhance those risks. I agree completely. You know, the, and what people need to understand is as we put greater risk on developers, that gets reflected in the prices that they propose on these projects. Sure. The more risk they undertake, the greater the price. That's just the nature of the beast. But, but you know, action speaks louder than words. I mean, we can tell them that we love them all all day long, but at the end of the day, they need to see that we've gotten our act together and are able to push things through in a reasonable time, because time does hurt uh, developers. Sure. They, they can't st stick around for, you know, too much time before they run out of money. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm still wondering: are we are we structured the right way? I mean, I've started looking at like what California is doing now, and they're they're in a different situation, but they seem to be moving along. And you feel like if you're a if you're a developer, uh, you could go to California and make some money. But I think we ought to make it so that people can expect to, or developers can expect to make some money here in the energy business. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm asking: um, Do you do, does anything come to mind that you that we're doing wrong now, or that we should uh, change in terms of structure? Well, the, when I go back to the competitive bidding framework, that really has to change. We need to be able to evaluate projects um, that are, are sited in the same location. That, you know, it's like evaluating a, a, you know, bids on a construction project. You have a site, you have a, 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 a plan in mind, and then you, you go to the contractors and you say, hey, this is what we want, come on and bid. You get the best price, everybody knows what the rules are, Everybody knows that the, 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 the developer who puts in the low bid is going to be the winner, and that's, that's how the, the process should work. You know, so what we need to do, you know, and, and I'll give credit where credit is due, this Dean Nishinam, who is my, my, the successor to, to the consumer advocate, he's he the current here, consumer advocate. <laughs> this is his idea. You know, you, you ha you, Hawaiian Electric should find a parcel of land and say, okay, we want a 25 megawatt solar farm in this location. Come on and bid on this. We want, you know, this is what, do we want a battery? No. Yes, battery. You know, th th that, that's how Sounds so simple. Then take a low bid. I mean, you take the low, low bid. The low credible exactly. bid. But how long could that take? I mean, is that, is that, you know, two years? How long could that take to do that? To, to change the competitive bidding to framework? To do it that way. To do it that you, you could have a project in a couple of years. That's what I think. Including construction. Including construction. We got to do that. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah. Ray's not disagreeing. 
I, you know, I, I think we do have to do that and, and some more. <laughs> so I, I guess my, my question also is, uh, are, are the, the structures are set up the way they are now. Would you add any structures? Would you take away structures in terms of sort of how we manage the planning and then the regulation uh, and, and then making sure that the consumer interest is, is uh, taken care of as well? Are we set up right to do it? I, I think the setup, I think the general structure is there. I think we can work with it. It needs improvement. There, that, that, that's, there's no question about that. Um, a lot of people want to see, you know, uh, performance-based rate making for Hawaiian Electric, for example. You know, w would we get better performance if Hawaiian Electric's rate of return, their, their return on equity was dependent upon how they actually perform? And, and I'm all in favor of that. I, you know, performance-based rate making, I say yes, I think that's a great idea, but we need to move cautiously with it because there are unintended consequences that come with it. And you know, we, we, we have cost of service regulation right now, and that is a form of incentive-based regulation. It can be improved, so we can add in performance metrics that HECO needs to meet beyond just the, the usual SADI, KD, um, you know, metrics that, that, that we talk about, you know, the, the interruption um, metrics. So we can, we can put in things. Like one of the things we suggested in the decoupling investigation was a planning metric. You know, Hiko, if you do good planning, planning yeah. yeah, that's right. If you do good planning to be decided by a committee of two or three individuals, mm -hmm. um, you can get a 25, 50 basis point, you know, boost in your return on equity. If you do poor planning, maybe we're going to have to penalize you. Um, that didn't seem to gain any traction with the the, the PUC. Well, no, but I think that goes to you know really that goes to raise question about. What can we do to shape an otherwise unruly situation where people are, you know, into self-interest and they're into silos? They don't talk to each other. They don't help each other out. Um, and you know, the, the result, of course, is that we we haven't moved nearly as fast as we wanted. So, what should the legislature do? Should we talk about credits or, you know, or disincentives? Should we um, should we change the way these decisions are made? Uh, at the PUC, should we? Uh, how can we speed it up? How can we keep it equitable? How can we preserve, you know, for example, good rates? Um, how can we come into the 21st century? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew those answers, I'd, I'd be governor. <laughs> I, you know, th I mean, those are difficult questions, Jay. I, you know, I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. You know, it, well, then you'll have to come back. <laughs> okay, Ray, we're out of time, Ray. Can you summarize and, uh, and, and put it where it belongs? Well, I, I think what, uh, from the discussions today, I think uh, that things are, are moving forward, but not nearly as quickly as they could. And uh, it takes too long to get things uh, done, especially when you have to bid them out. So maybe the maybe the process uh, needs to be looked at and and uh, some things changed about the process and obviously now that you're not the consumer advocate anymore you can you can uh, pound the table <laughs> and say, say things maybe even stronger than you could as a consumer advocate so we'd like to make sure you come back to see us uh, in the near future and let's continue the conversation I would love to. Amen to that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Jeff. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Great to have you here. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray.